the great reconciliation. How God used Jesus the Christ to reconcile the world to himself. If you haven't figured it out by now, this Bible is really a book about Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament was leading up. It's shadows and types of Jesus pointing about him, prophesying concerning his death. Uh, and uh, it's culminated in Jesus being the centerfold of it all. And then he is the coming king. And so it is about Jesus who was and is and is to come. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word was Jesus. He's the Word made flesh among us. And, and I want you to notice here, he's talking about this great reconciliation. You don't ever become uh, comfortable in your salvation. Whenever you begin to, to take something, become too comfortable with something, you start taking it for granted. And whenever you start taking something for granted, you set yourself up to lose. So this is why I think we get the warning here in verse 23 where it says, if indeed you continue in the faith. Wonder why he said, if you continue in the faith. Because, you know, if is the badge of doubt. You don't automatically continue in the faith just because you started in the faith. I know some folks that started in the faith and didn't continue in the faith. Anybody know anybody that got saved but they didn't stay saved? You know, they, they started in the faith. He says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast. Isn't it amazing that some people get in the faith but don't ever get grounded? And they are never steadfast? I'd encourage you to underline these words in your Bible. Grounded, steadfast, continue in the faith. And are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. I found some people, you, you can find yourself that if, if you don't get grounded, you'll find yourself drifting. Drifting. And, and, and the drifting can happen so slowly and so subtly, you don't even realize what will have happened. You just start drifting. It's sort of like when, when you start spending money on stuff and you're not keeping an account of it. And all of a sudden, you, you get to a point and then you wonder, where's all my money? It, it just sort of slips away, doesn't it? Have you ever noticed that when you don't manage your time well, uh, then you, you, you'll wake up and, and you'll say, I wonder where all of the time went. It's like your time just slipped away. Just time is just zipping by before you can know it. And here it is this time. I mean, sometimes when I lay down, it's like I've been in the twilight zone. You know, it's, you, you wake up and I mean, I feel like I've been asleep for five minutes and, and it's time to start another day. Anybody else feel that way? You just wonder, where did the time go? It, it really is a time warp. If you ever, one of those kind of folks, you know, when the alarm clock goes off and you have trouble getting up, you press the snooze button. That's the quickest five minutes that I've ever seen in all of the days of my life. I mean, that's just really, I mean, where, where does that time go? Those minutes go by like, like seconds. They really do. But this is why he says you have to make sure that you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Don't, don't let people move you away. And this moving away is really a drifting. It is a drifting away where it comes very, very gradual and you don't even realize it until one day you find that, that, that your, your anchor has been pulled up. And you've been drifting and, 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 and not even aware of it. And when I think about reconciliation, I think about how human beings respond to other human beings whenever there's a crisis as opposed to how Jesus Christ responds to humanity uh, whenever there is a crisis. And I'm not sure if it is our lack of concern or, you know, our apathy that is the, re the result of what comes out as cowardice or selfishness. It's, it's, am I, it's amazing. I don't really know which it is. But it is clear that Jesus Christ exhibits a very sacrificial and unconditional love for humanity. God used Jesus to reconcile the world to himself. And I want you to notice these words here. All the fullness of God dwells in Jesus Christ. All of the fullness. All the fullness. See, this was a, 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 a real attempt at answering some things that had slipped in through Gnosticism in the early church. And some of the teachers were teaching that uh, it was not, that was not all that God could do through Jesus. That was not the totality. And Paul was correcting this fallacious 
uh, teaching that was going on as a result of the influence of Gnosticism. The term fullness can mean a supplement, which is something added to supply a deficiency. You know how you have to have enriched bread? The only reason that the bread has to be enriched is because it didn't have enough nutritional value to even qualify uh, as, as, a, as a legitimate food item for us. And so we have to enrich it to bring it up to a certain nutritional standard. It was so devoid of nutrients. Anytime you see something that's enriched, it has been supplemented with that. And so one idea and understanding of this word fullness is a supplement, something that is added to supply a deficiency. And the other one is a complement, which is the full number that makes up the whole. And see, Jesus is, is, is the full number that makes up the whole. He's, he's uh, the complement. He's the fullness of God. Uh, he dwells in him. It's not just a one-time thing that he just hit it one time. No, no, no. That's a constant. This is a, a constant state that he, he has taken up residency in Jesus Christ. In him the fullness. You get the fullness. You get Jesus. You got the whole ball of wax. You got God. You got the Holy Ghost. You got it all wrapped up in Jesus. You get Jesus. He is the fullness, the completeness. Uh, to the exemption of none. He is the totality of this thing wrapped up in, in Jesus Christ. And so Paul was addressing, addressing this, this uh, fallacious teaching that had gone out as a result of, of Gnosticism. And it's, it's interesting. Sometimes you don't realize how little concern human beings have for other human beings in some instances. Uh, on April 15th, 1912, 1912. This was the year when the, the white star liner called the Titanic began to sink into the icy waters, leaving 1,600 people crying and drowning in the icy waters of the Atlantic Ocean. And the very sad truth about the story was to see the self-serving cowardice that allowed 16, nearly 1,600 people to perish. Out of the 1,600 people that didn't get in the lifeboat, only 13 of them were rescued out of 1,600. And here's what a lot of people don't realize, that of the 1,600 who were not able to get on the lifeboats, uh, only 13 of them were picked up by 18 half-empty boats that hovered nearby. In boat number five, there was third officer Pittman who was there. He heard the anguished cries of people drowning in those icy waters, and he turned the boat around and shouted, Now men, we will pull forward uh, toward the wreck. But the passengers protested and said, Why should we all lose our lives in a useless attempt to save others from the ship? And Pittman, the captain, gave in. And they watched people as they pulled away, people crying out in desperation, save me, save me, and they pulled away. And, and, uh, and then for the next hour, boat number five, with 40 people on board, 40 people on board, and it had a capacity of 65. They could have taken 25 more people. And they just moved on gently through the calm Atlantic waters while those 40 passengers listened to the fading cries of swimmers who were drowning and dying 300 yards away. It's amazing. And then in boat number two, fourth officer Boxhall asked the ladies, shall we go back? And they said, no. And so boat number two, about 60% full, likewise drifted while her people callously listened to the cries of other people desperately crying out for help. And then on boat number six, the situation was reversed as the women begged quartermaster Hitchens to return, but he refused, painting a vivid picture of those drowning, overturning the boat. And the women pleaded as the cries grew fewer. But of the 18 boats, only one boat, number 14, returned to help. And this was an hour after the Titanic sinking, when the thrashing crowd had thinned out. And it's interesting to see that the drama here of the sinking of the Titanic 
It is a parable of a world gone wrong. That you could watch dying people in icy waters and have the capacity to be able to save more and turn in fear of your own life that they're going to rush the boat and pull us over and we'll all perish. Let's not risk losing our lives trying to save some, as many as we can. The wrongness of everything points to the fundamental problem of people's estrangement from each other and from uh, creation of sin. This really is a picture of a world desperately in need of reconciliation and the harmony and rightness which that brings. When you understand this word reconcile, say reconcile. Reconcile means to establish a close relationship between, to establish, a, a, a reestablish, reestablish a close relationship between. I know people that need to be reconciled in their marriage, reconciled in their friendship, people that left companies with a bitter taste in their mouth and they are angry and they need to be reconciled, people who need to be reconciled with other family members. It's amazing. Uh, just, just today uh, I met a big powerful muscle man and, and he said to me that your words recently pricked my heart and I called my father on Sunday after many years and discovered that my daddy was in the hospital. He said, I'm so glad you provoked me to call my daddy after all of this time. I'm so glad. And so it means to reestablish a close relationship between, to reconcile. Another meaning is to settle or to resolve. To settle or to resolve. When you reconcile, you settle something, you resolve it. You've had an issue with a company and you, you settle it. You resolve the, the issue, the complaint. Another one is to make compatible or consistent. To make compatible or consistent. Because when you're reconciling things, you're making adjustments on one side so that the other side will also balance. It's, it's sort of a banking term of, of reconciliation. Everything in the universe will be reconciled to God except that which rejects Him. 